Hey everybody, Zach again, NewTutorial.com, coming in making a video for you today. We're going to talk about Passover. Every time this time of year rolls around, people send me questions. A lot of them I usually don't try to get into because they can be a little bit controversial. So I figure I'll go ahead and tackle it all in one video um, and just address some of those more controversial topics uh, that normally I won't dive into. So we're going to talk about that today. Four topics concerning Passover. Uh, number one is when is Passover? Uh, number two is what about this whole leaven thing? What do I have to get rid of in my home? Do I get rid of this? Do I get rid of that? And is there a spiritual meaning behind all this? Uh, the second thing or the third thing we're going to talk about is uh, doing this within our gates. Uh, there are people every year who come to me and they say, Zach, we're not allowed to do Passover unless we're in Jerusalem. You cannot do this at home, Zach, so don't do it. Otherwise, you're sinning. What does that really mean? We'll talk about that as well. And then the fourth thing, wait a minute, I gotta look at my notes. Sacrifice. Is it actually a sacrifice? Zach, I hear you're killing a sheep on your homestead. You can't do that. That's a sacrifice. Don't do that. We'll talk about that as well. So those four topics. Number one, when is Passover? That's got to be the number one question I get. And usually when you email me that question, I don't respond. Usually. I actually got that question this morning and I responded uh, by, to someone. But mostly I do not answer that question because really it's a controversial question. Because here's what will happen. I'll type back what I believe and when I believe you should be celebrating Passover and then someone will tell that person, you heard what from who? Oh, that guy's wrong. He's got it all messed up. And then you'll come back to me and says, well, such and such. And then it comes into a whole long conversation. And I got a dozen people trying to figure out what is the right thing and trying to draw me in on it. I don't want any part of that. So here's the deal. Years ago, I started off as a sliverist and I used the sliver of the moon to calculate when I began the new year, which then tells me when I began Passover. So uh, then after some study, I switched over to be a being a conjunction. Uh, conjunction, conjunctionist, I guess is what you call it. And so I go by the conjunction of the moon. And that's kind of where I stay. I, I have studied a lot of different calendars, Zadok calendars, Enoch calendars, conjunctions, sliver calendars on different levels. There's like, there's like different types of sliver and conjunction calendars out there. And then you have the traditionalist uh, Jewish calendar that a lot of Jews follow. And a lot of people do that as well. Here's the deal, folks. Do whatever you think is right. Because here's the reality. When we're all standing before the Father one day, he's not going to be like, depart from me, you who did not do Passover on the, on the right day. You know, he's not going to be that way. He got mad at his people, not for keeping Passover. I can't find one example in the scriptures of the Father getting angry at his people for keeping the holidays on the wrong day. I can't find one example. If you can find an example out there, please show me. What he got mad at them for was not keeping it at all or just doing it in a haphazard way. I don't really care. You know, if I bring it, if I bring an offering to the temple, it's a, it's lame or blind, you know. No, they weren't keeping it at all. They weren't taking his commandments seriously. I think you should keep the commandments and take them seriously. But, you know, we're all going to have different interpretations right now on how exactly we keep them exactly by the book. And I think there's a lot of different people out there who think that their calendar is exactly the way it's supposed to be, and I'm not that kind of guy. I am not dogmatic about my calendar. I may be keeping the wrong calendar. One day our Messiah will come, and he will set us all straight, and we'll all keep that calendar. But right now, even the Jews admit that they're following the wrong calendar. They, they, they don't even agree on that. So there's not one thing, there's not, if somebody out there says this is the calendar you have to follow and all the other calendars are wrong, that person has not studied enough and is surely not humble enough. I think we need to humble ourselves, realize that we don't have everything correct, and we're going to try our best until the Messiah comes and he sets us all straight. So when is the right Passover? You study, you come up with an answer to that, and then keep it. Okay, so I think, I really believe, and I've said this before in my videos, I really believe the Father looks at his children right now, he's looking down at us, and he's saying, oh, finally, they're, they're zealous for my law, they're trying to keep my law, they're not doing it right, just like a, that's what, just like a young child tries to keep the instructions of, of a parent, but most often doesn't do it exactly the way the parent wants to, doesn't do it exactly right and correctly, but they're trying. If they're trying, that's what the Father really loves because there's the heart. They have a heart to keep my commandments. And he's looking at all these people, probably laughing, you know, they're trying their best to walk across the floor, but just like a little baby, they're not ready to walk yet. They're getting there, 
but they're not there yet. So we're waiting for that day. <laughs> we're waiting for that day. Okay, so that's my first one. When is Passover? Number two, getting rid of the leaven out of the house. So this one has come in a number of times already this year. Zach, what exactly do I need to get rid out of my house? Get rid of out of my house? Do I need to get rid of baking powder? What about baking soda? Well, you know, what about my yeast? Do I get rid of the yeast? Um, you know, bread, obviously, I get rid of all my bread, but what about beer? Beer's made with yeast. We should get rid of the beer too. What about wine? Wine is made with yeast. I gotta get rid of the wine. What do I get rid of, Zach? Here's the deal. Okay, so one of our favorite books on the homestead is this one right here. It's called Nourishing Traditions. And uh, my wife, Jamie, really loved this book. Um, and she uh, used it quite a bit for a number of different things. One of the things she used most often in this, especially when she first got it, was learning about sourdough bread. And so if you realize that most people could not go to the store a couple hundred years ago and just buy regular store-bought yeast. Okay, they couldn't buy that. Um, some places maybe could, but most places could not. 200 years ago and beyond was not available. That's something new. It's modern. And so what they had to do was, just like this book describes Nourishing Traditions, great book, by the way, highly recommend it. Um, and, and even though it's got some unclean things in there for those of you who are worried about that, but it's got a lot of great info, including how to start a sourdough starter. What you had to do was basically take a bowl, add some water, add some flour, and then let the air add the yeast because yeast is all around us. It's in the air you breathe. You can't get away from it. It's impossible. And so what you would do is for seven days, you would basically add water and add flour to that bowl, okay, and let it sit out. And then as the yeast begin, from the air began to infect that bowl, it would create leaven. You would be able to take that and mix that every day and then take a portion of that leaven out of your sourdough starter and then mix it with your bread to leaven all of your bread. And that would make it rise. And you would make your daily bread that way. Everyone did that 200 years ago and prior. If you made bread, you had a starter. And that's what the scripture says. Let's go ahead and read the scripture. Exodus 12, 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eats that which is leavened even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. So seven days, no leaven found in your houses. You're not allowed to eat any leaven. Well, you don't eat yeast. You don't eat baking soda. You don't eat, I mean, I guess you could eat that stuff, but it's not going to taste very good. No one would normally eat that thing. No one back then ate it because they didn't have it. Uh, beer and wine is not leaven. Um, and so it's not talking about beer. It says, get rid of the leaven and anything, any bread in your house, get rid of that. That's specifically what it says. The yeast is in the air. You have to lock, you'd have to suffocate yourself to death to get rid of all the yeast. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that's really what it's talking about. So don't try to impose all kinds of restrictions on yourself when keeping the commandment is not hard. It's simple. It's easy. And yes, there is a spiritual meaning behind that. Let's take a look at the book of Matthew. Matthew 16, 6. Then Yeshua, Jesus, said unto them, Take heed and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matthew 16, 11, How is it that you do not understand what I spoke of concerning the bread? That you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then 16, 12, Then they understood what he was talking about, of bewaring of the leavened bread of the, of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They understood that the leaven was the doctrine, was the teaching. It wasn't, had nothing to do with sin. People say we get rid of leaven every year out of our homes because we're trying to get the sin out of our lives. That's not necessarily true because it doesn't make any sense at all that you would take leaven out of your homes for a week to bring it back in if it's representative of sin. Yeah, get the sin out of your house for seven days, then bring it back. No, it's what it's talking about is doctrine. Take, it's, it's basically telling you to audit your life. Use the leaven as a way to audit when people teach you things. Go back to your scriptures. You're going to go into your scriptures for seven days during that time of unleavened bread. It's a time of holy convocation. And you're going to examine those scriptures and see what you believe. Understand what is sin, what is not. What is bad teaching, what is not. And if it's bad, then remove it out of your life. Okay, and then you're going to start, see, because you can't take the leaven, throw it out, and just bring that leaven back. No, what do you have to do at the end of seven days? You have to start a new starter. 
You have to get a new bowl, you have to get new flour, you have to get new water, and begin your starter again. There are some people out there who have a starter they've been using for decades. I mean, you can read about them online. And, you know, there's people all over, all over the world, and there are people who are bred aficionados who say that starters in Italy taste completely different than a starter in Germany because of the air. The yeast that's in the air make it taste different. There's a, a distinct flavor of the bread. So I, I don't know any about it. I don't know anything about that. I don't know if it's true, but it's interesting. You see, they're keeping their starter alive for decades. That's not exactly what the Bible says to do. That would be breaking Torah. Every year you get a new starter. You start fresh. You start new. You start with the Word, which is bread, right? The Word is bread. But you start with that new bread every year. And see, that's the spiritual meaning of getting the, the leaven out of your house. Examining everything that someone's been teaching to you or talking to you about, getting rid of it all, and going back to the Word. Going back to the Word. The real bread of life, right? Okay, so I hope that makes sense. You don't have to get rid of your beer. You don't have to get rid of your wine. It doesn't say to get rid of any of those things. It just says get rid of the bread and the leaven. The leaven is the starter and the bread that you've made with that starter. Get rid of it. Get it out of your house. Keep your beer. Keep your wine. I'll keep, I'm definitely keeping my wine. So, okay, let's move on. Every year I get people who tell me, Zach, you cannot keep this feast at home. You have to go to Jerusalem. And because you can't go to Jerusalem, you might as well not keep Passover. Because if you do, you're breaking Torah. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Understand this basic foundation that when they're standing before the Jordan River and Moses and through the book of Deuteronomy is going through the entire Torah to these people all over again. He's saying, hey, listen, this, these are the rules. These are the commandments. These are the instructions you will have in that land over there. And if you don't keep them, the father will spit you out of that land and you'll go into the nations. And when that happens, Deuteronomy 30 verse 3, and you, for, you remember the God's commandments, and you begin to obey, I'll bring you back. So understand what that means. He says, listen, these commandments are for all the land. That includes do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, you know, honor your mother and your father, and you know, keep my feast. Okay, those are for all the land. But there's going to be a time where you disobey. I'm going to kick you out of the land. Does that mean when you're out of the land, and you're in dispersion, that you can murder, you can lie, you can steal, you can dishonor your mother and your father. You don't have to worry about the feast anymore. Wait a minute. See, they're all included. It's all the same. It's all the same commandments. Here's the verses that come into question. Deuteronomy 16, verse 5 and 6. And I know there's more of them, but we're going to concentrate on these. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God gives thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at even out of the going down of the sun at the season which you came forth out of Egypt. Yeah, see, you're not allowed to keep it at your home. You have to go to Jerusalem. The reason this commandment was given like it was, was that he did not want them keeping the, the, the Passovers and all these festivals you know, at their homes, at their farms, in their towns and cities. No, no, I want you to all come together as one nation in the place where I put my name. Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. That's where he puts his name, Yah, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. He come all together as one big family. I don't want you keeping it out there by yourselves. I don't want you in sex. I don't want you in clicks. Sex. <laughs> clicks. Is that a better word? Clicks. I don't want you in clicks. I want you to all come together. I don't want you in your tribes. Come together as one family. Don't keep these at home. But see, we're in dispersion now. And Deuteronomy 30, verse 3 is very clear. You're going to keep these commandments, and then I will regather you from all the places I scattered you and bring you back. So to obey in dispersion would mean not lying, not stealing, not committing adultery, not murdering people, honoring your father and mother, and keeping the feast. And keeping the feast. If you're one of these people who tries to tell me that you can't keep Passover unless you're in Jerusalem, fine. You go home, sit at home by yourself. We're all going to keep the feast. The Feast of Tabernacles, when we come together, we have a big party here. And there's people every year who tell me I can't do it. I shouldn't do it. It's a sin to do it. No, no, no. It says you will obey in those nations and then I will regather you back. Part of that obedience 
not lying, not stealing, not committing adultery, not, you know, not murdering people, all the other commandments, keeping the Sabbath, all of those commandments were for the land. But see, we're going to keep them now because we want to show the Father, hey, listen, we're going to obey in the hopes that you will regather us back. Deuteronomy 30, verse 3. You're going to regather us back again from all the lands where we've been scattered. So I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to keep the feast. If you don't want to, go home and do that wherever you want to do it. You, you, you just go home and be a bump on a log and we'll party. Okay, we'll rejoice. We'll, we'll use this as a time to memorialize what took place. And we'll, we'll pray and we'll worship the Father and we will ask him, Father, is it time yet to bring us home? Are you going to bring us home? You know, there was never a time in my Bible, in my New Testament that I've seen where he says, depart from me, you who kept the Passover at home. No, he says, you who work lawlessness, people who don't even keep the Passover, people who don't even know about it, who don't want to know about it. They're rebellious. Their hearts are rebellious against God. But what we have here are people whose hearts are circumcised to God in his commandments. They want to do what he tells us to do. We want to be obedient. See, that's a circumcised heart a desire to be obedient. I hope that answers your question. All right, last one, sacrifices. <clears throat> sacrifices. This can be, this is going to get the people angry. Every year I get people who ask me, Zach, why are you butchering a sheep for Passover? Don't you know that's a sacrifice? How dare you sacrifice an animal? You cannot sacrifice an animal. And a lot of times they use those same passages in Deuteronomy 16 or sometimes Deuteronomy 12. <sighs> Folks, what is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that you give up. So you're at a baseball game. No outs, man on third, next batter up, hits a long fly ball into deep center field. Center fielder catches the ball, the man on third tags, runs home, the ball doesn't get there in time, you just scored a point. It's called a sacrifice fly. You gave up something of value, your team gave up something of value to obtain a point to get on the scoreboard. Does that make sense? Giving up something of value, that's all a sacrifice is. That's all a sacrifice ever is. In Leviticus chapter 1, you look through the entire chapter of Leviticus chapter 1, and it's not that really that long of a chapter, but it's all about one thing and one thing only, without spot or blemish. Without spot or blemish. Whether it's cattle, whether it's sheep or goats, whether it's pigeons or turtle doves, all of it has to be without spot or blemish. <laughs> Because that's what a sacrifice is. You want to know why? Because I've been a sheep farmer now for a few years, I've learned a few things. You see, I've learned that the ones that are without spot or blemish are genetically purer than the others. And whenever you have a large herd, let's just say you have a herd of about 100 to 200 sheep. Sometimes herds were much greater than that. But let's just say you have 200 sheep. Every year you get about two or three that are males that are just about perfect. They're perfect, and so you take those males out of your herd and you, and you put them separate from the rest of the herd. And because you're going to take those males and you're either going to sell them to other sheep herders who want to better their flock because of their good genetics, they have very little spots or blemishes, and that's usually what the spots or blemishes means. It has, do they have like hip displacements and how are they standing? Are they, they have issues with their bone structure, things like that. You take those perfect sheep and then you sell them for high dollar because they're worth a lot of money. Because sheep herders, real sheep farmers will say, hey, listen, that's worth a lot. It's highly valued because I can take that male and use him as a sire for the rest of my herd and produce a better genetically, you know, pure herd. With his genetics, I can take and make a better herd. And if I have a better herd, I make more money. It's something of great value. And so what do you do? You set that aside. But God says, no, no, no. Your best, I get. You can have your second best. But your best, come to me. And so he talks about for these sacrifices, whether it's a Thanksgiving offering or a peace offering or whatever offering it is, all of the offerings, all of them must be without spot or blemish. Most of your herd is not going to be without spot or blemish. Okay, and so you take the best, you set it aside, and then you give that to the Father. And then what's left, you can use to either better your herd or sell for high dollar to someone else's herd so that they can better their herd. I hope that makes sense. The sacrifice for Passover, I'm killing a sheep. It's going to uh, not all be eaten because you can't eat the whole thing. And so you burn the rest up before morning. 
you've sacrificed it, meaning you gave it up. So instead of taking one of the male lambs that I have and selling it, I would probably get about 150 bucks for it. I eat it, I eat what I can within one night and I burn the rest. I gave it up. Yeah, it's a sacrifice. Get over it. Does, what does a sacrifice really mean? It means to give something up. We just sold our milk cow. It was a miniature milk cow. And because of the change on the homestead, um, my wife passing, it was really kind of our thing together. We were going to work on this together and she wanted to be a milker of it. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. So I can't take care of this milk cow. And there are a lot of people who would like the milk cow. Well, the milk cow now has a calf. It's going to be a, a part Jersey, part Hereford. So it's going to be a lot of, um, it's going to be a lot of beef on that Hereford. It's a bull. It's a bull calf. So firstborns, it's a firstborn for her, you know, they have to be given to the father. What do I do with it? I sold it. I took that $500 and I'm going to give it to a ministry, probably a food bank. Actually, I gave $100 away already to someone who needed it. But I'm going to take that remaining $400 and I'm going to give it to a food bank. I'm going to sacrifice that bull calf by selling it and taking the money that was given to me and then I'm going to give it away because I can't take it to a temple. I can't take it to an altar. I don't have one of those around here, okay? And there, I can't go to Jerusalem to do it. So I'm going to sell that bull calf and then give the money away. By doing so, by giving up that bull calf, which having would have grown, would have brought more money or would have been a lot of beef for my family, I have sacrificed that animal. I gave it up. To give up something. Man hits a long fly ball to deep center field. Man on third tags up, heads home. It's a sacrifice fly. They gave up an out to achieve a point. It's giving up something for, to achieve something else. I'm giving up an offering to achieve obedience to my father because he calls for it, because he says to do it. Now, there are people out there who say you shouldn't eat lamb on Passover. That you don't do that anymore. Instead, you do the Haggadah and you, do, you eat chicken and you put an egg on your plate and you put this lamb shank, and all this stuff that's nowhere found in your Torah. Guys, Numbers chapter 9 says to keep the Passover with all of the rites and the ceremonies thereof. Rites, R-I-T-E-S, and ceremonies thereof. The only place you will find in your Torah of the rites and the ceremonies on how to keep Passover is Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 12 only is the only place in your Bible where you will find the rites and the ceremonies to keep Passover. And Numbers chapter 9 is talking about the second Passover, okay, a year after the first. It's saying, keep Passover with all the rites and the ceremonies thereof. Now, some of those rites and ceremonies you're not allowed to keep. You can't keep because we're not in the land. I get it. But I'm going to keep as many as I can. I'm going to do my, the best as I can to do all of Exodus chapter 12 um, when I do Passover. Am I going to do it perfectly? No. Can I do it at all? Mostly perfectly? No. Because I'm not in the land, again. But you do what you can do. You know my first Passover? My first Passover, I was living in St. We were living in St. Louis, and we decided to keep Passover. And so I went down. I was living in St. Louis, uh, South County, Kenrick's Meat Market. I think it's off Gravois down there. And so I go down to Gravois Kendrick's Meat Market and I bought a leg of lamb, bone in. I paid like a hundred bucks for a bone in leg of lamb and I realized I'm in the wrong business. So now I have sheep. <laughs> so I bought a leg of lamb, we brought it home, we cooked it up and I burned the rest of it on the barbecue. Whatever was left over wasn't much. We had some, fr some folks over, some friends over. And so uh, we ate the rest of the leg of lamb and um, we, whatever was left, we burned up on the barbecue pit, okay? It was, it was 100 bucks. okay? That's what I could do at the time. I lived in the city. I couldn't get a lamb. I couldn't butcher a lamb for sure. I was renting. My landlord probably would not have been happy with that because all the, co all the neighbors would have called the cops. <laughs> so I did what I, I've heard of families who just go out and buy lamb burgers. You know, do that. I've heard of people who can't get lamb. Okay, fine, have a chicken, whatever. Keep it as best as you can. Keep it as a memorial because really that's what it is. But one day, one day, the Father's going to bring his people back to that land over there, and we're going to keep it the way Numbers chapter 9 says, with all of the rites and the ceremonies thereof. We're going to kill a lamb, 
And yeah, we're going to put the blood on the doorpost. And we're going to do it with hyssop. We're going to do it with all the rites and the ceremonies thereof. Because that's what it says to do. That's what our Messiah did. I guarantee you that's what he did. Okay? That's what I'm doing. Listen, however you do it, I hope you're blessed. I hope you have a great and wonderful Passover. I hope it's very meaningful to you. And that, you know, you'll continue to grow in the Word. Because the more you do of the Word, the more the meaning of the Word will come to you and make sense to you. All right, we'll leave it at that. Go home, read your Bible. Thanks.